we're entering such a new phase of history at the moment. Uh, we're going to need some new thinking about how we deal with issues about employment in our community, uh, social justice issues, climate issues, and uh, let's hope the Fabian's up there as it has been historically in offering good advice on what is a new world we're in. Uh, and uh, I fear that there's still a fair bit of complacency in Australia about what's going to happen as we move out of the uh, restrictions that we've seen with COVID. Uh, it's, it's going to be a different world that will require different policies. But tonight, I want, to, I want to talk about three concepts. The first one is uh, well known to us all, representative democracy. And the chief focus when we talk about representative democracy, of course, are elections. And uh, when you tune into the ACT branch, that'll be the topic of discussion uh, on the, the Hare Clark proportional representation system. The second one is called monetary democracy, which is a term that's been developed by a professor at Sydney University, uh, Professor John Keenan. It refers to representative democracy plus all of those institutions we've created uh, to ensure that we get the public interest. Auditor General, Electoral Commissions, Corruption Commissions, uh, Information Commissioner, Privacy Commissioner, with great independent powers in order to monitor the way that government operates. And they provide a check and a balance. So elections, majority rule, backed up by monitoring checks and balances to make sure that the public interest is protected. And when we talk about democracy, we usually focus on those two. Uh, we point to the, whether or not our elections are fair, whether they're free, whether they're subject to influences which are distorting uh, the public will. When it comes to uh, the checks and balances, we look at whether or not they're genuinely independent, whether or not they have the capacity uh, to speak truth to power, uh, as they need to do from time to time when the executive arm of government or or the political class in general deviate from, from the law or from the, uh, the public interest which backs up our legal system. I want to add another, and let's call that deliberative democracy, to that equation. If this is a focus. The focus here is on a new way of involving the people in the political process, a way that has a lot of history because it's used, of course, in criminal trials, the jury system, uh, you, you, it's, you would know how that works. You randomly select a jury, uh, they look at all of the evidence and then they make a judgment. And that's essentially what the philosophy of new democracy is. But I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later on. The argument I want to put to you tonight to consider is that we need to care a lot about our elections and our representative system. We need to care a lot about our accountability agencies and whether or not they're working well. But there's more that more to that, we need to take seriously the potential for deliberative democracy uh, uh, to add value to our system of government. And so I'm trying to widen the debate out. We normally talk about representation. We talk about checks and balances. Let's go one step further and look at deliberative democracy and ask the question, how can we use that to improve our system uh, in terms of its democratic quality? Now, as, as Natalie said, I'm the chairman of the New Democracy Foundation um, Research Committee. The New Democracy Foundation is independent. It's a non-for-profit. It focuses solely on our democratic system and, and the ways and means by which we can improve it. It partners with governments uh, to undertake deliberative experiments uh, and also it undertakes research, both here and in relation to what we do uh, uh, what we what we do here in Australia through the partnerships that we have. And so it's, it's really focused on democracy. It's encouraging people to look more broadly into what we would call the deliberative space to improve the quality of that democracy. Uh, I chair the research committee. Also on that research committee is Nick Greiner, who, of course, was uh, the uh, Premier of New South Wales from the other side of politics. And uh, we also have, uh, we've had very good support uh, recently with, from Jay Weatherall, who was the Premier of South Australia. And indeed, one good example of deliberative democracy was uh, introduced by Jay when he established the, the uh, Citizens' Assembly in 2016 into the proposal uh, for South Australia to store and dispose of nuclear waste from other countries. Very controversial issue. They had a Royal Commission that recommended it, uh, and Jay 
went out to the community, randomly selected people. There were two assemblies. One looked at what are the questions we need to ask if we're going to have a proper debate about this issue. And then secondly, with those questions, what are the conclusions? Uh, the citizens' assembly, in the end, determined uh, that it wasn't in South Australia's interest uh, to do that. So that's a good example of the sort of partnerships that uh, where I could go through many others, but but I won't do that. Um, as you know, when when the Gallup government was in place, uh, Alana McTiern was was a pioneer uh, with these instruments. The most obvious example being the uh, dialogue with the city that we did uh, in relation to the future of the Perth metropolitan area. Research, of course, is very important. Um, one of the documents I'd like to draw your attention to is uh, enabling national initiatives to take democracy beyond elections. It's to the credit of the New Democracy Foundation and its board uh, that it was chosen from the United Nations Democracy Fund uh, to prepare that uh, document, which gives you the background and the details of how you would conduct a proper jury or assembly uh, with regard to a particular public policy program. So we have a lot of links overseas. Um, uh, we have a, a, a co-research director based in San Francisco. We've done a lot of work in Europe. Uh, a, a team of the New South Wales Parliament was taken to Europe recently to invest, uh, investigate a new proposal in Belgium, where the German-speaking region of Belgium, their local, uh, their local parliament will have an upper house totally randomly selected. And that's, that's a really big initiative in terms of this issue. So we do the research, we do the partnerships with governments, and uh, hopefully we inform people on ways and means that they can add value to our system. So let me then go back to the, to the beginning, if you like, and ask this question. Uh, what is happening in, in, in our democracy today? In Europe, North America, and, and, and other places like Australia and New Zealand, where um, there are many, many challenges being thrown up. I'm referring here, of course, to the challenges faced by our representative system, uh, to fair and free elections, uh, the challenges to our independent agencies of accountability and the role that they have to play. Uh, and there's a lot that we can say about, the, about those issues. For example, at the national level, we don't have a corruption commission. Um, indeed, if I can just point out that when I first became involved in politics back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, the great reform arm of Australian government was, was Canberra. And of course, it came to a a, a, a crescendo when the Whitlam government was elected in 1972. And the federal government was, was doing all of the improvements on accountability. And the states tended to be quite corrupt as a result of their electoral systems, as a result of their inadequacy, inadequacies of their checks and balances. But now, I think I'd argue that the state governments have done a lot more to improve on accountability. And, and it's shown by way of the corruption issue where the federal government just simply, uh, and Parliament hasn't dealt with that issue, uh, and uh, one can, can see bits and pieces coming out now about how that's influencing politics. The contempt with which uh, the current government is handling some of these issues uh, about the expenditure of public money, the contempt about uh, the letter that was sent to uh, Clover Moore, these sorts of things, you, you know, at a state level, you just couldn't get away with that. I think we would have the inquiries in place, recommendations uh, uh, put forward, which would would make uh, much more accountability than we have. So there's all those issues. But, but let's, let's, let's look at two parts of, of, of that. The first is the influence of money invested interests in politics. And we tend to look at that issue in terms of uh, backroom deals, you know, donations, and the Labor Party's been putting forward some very uh, good ideas on how that can improve uh, in, in terms of the way our system works. But us yourself this question. Perhaps we also need to look at the way policy is made to address the question of influence on politics. Uh, you know, it, it's one thing to try and reduce the power of money uh, on the political party through direct legislation and regulation. Another way of looking at that question is to say, well, perhaps the way that we're making policy is allowing that to happen. In other words, policy that comes through the executive, goes to the parliament, the major players heavily influenced by vested interests and the outcomes you get are not satisfactory for the public interest. Perhaps we need another way of looking at some of these policies uh, through random selection and deliberation that would counter the influence 
of, of, of money because uh, 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 the independence and, and the rigour with which a lot of ju juries operate and, and assemblies operate would, would be a real counterbalance to the influence of money. Another one, of course, is the, the development of distrust between government and people. Now, a degree of distrust is necessary. I mean, in a good democracy, you've got to keep an open mind. You have to make sure that you keep uh, uh, those that are in executive positions, uh, you have to keep watching over what they do, etc. That's an important part of our system. But when the, the distrust reaches the level where people no longer care about politics and you see a squeezing out uh, of, of the middle, be it the centre-left party or the centre-right parties, towards uh, extremism, particularly of the populist authoritarian right-wing version, uh, and it's all fed by this, oh, you can't trust the politicians, they don't care about us, this is a very dangerous development, and I don't think I need to uh, outline to you how that's playing out in, in the United States currently. So I think those of us that are interested in, in social democracy, interested in improving our democratic system, uh, I, I think we need to pick up on, on, on these problems that exist. Another one, of course, is, is the difficulty we're having in Australia in any case, uh, and, and certainly throughout the democratic world, and this is becoming the source of criticism from those who don't like the democratic system, is the big issues are getting insufficient attention. The big issues are obviously the amazing uh, slide into increased inequality in countries uh, such as ours, a dramatic development, uh, and it's illustrated very clearly uh, in, in the work that's been done on alternative progress indicators, work that Jacinda Ardern has taken up in New Zealand. And if you go to her budget papers and you look at her analysis of the rate of economic growth determined, uh, uh, defined by the uh, gross domestic product and, and the rate of improvement in progress in New Zealand as outlined through a broader range of measures, level of inequality, uh, environmental amenity, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's a gap between the two. And, and what happened, I think, is into the 70s and 80s, the GDP and the progress indicator tended to go to, at the same level. After that, there's a gap emerge. Uh, the progress indicator uh, doesn't, uh, sorry, the gross domestic product is running ahead much far to, faster than the um, indicator of progress. And th this tells us, a there's a major issue in our society that the levels of inequality that we thought were totally unacceptable in the in in the post-war era, uh, as we came out of the war, there was a lot more social solidarity, uh, are now drifting away again, and that's a big issue. Labor tried to address it to some extent at the last election when it spoke on the franking credits issue. You know, we, we can argue about that whether it was good policy or not, and the negative gearing. But at least they were trying to sort of gear the system back into looking at how we can have a fairer share of the burdens and benefits associated with life today. So these big issues aren't being addressed. Climate, I mean, the Four Corners program recently showed that our system stalemated. You had Turnbull, Rudd, Brown, and they couldn't come up with an emissions trading system. Something was deeply wrong with our system and, uh, it, and the politicisation of it to the extent that we couldn't solve a major issue that's facing humanity, and that's climate change. Julia Gillard came in with a good uh, policy in cooperation with the Greens, uh, but unfortunately, her authority was never sufficient to carry that with the, with the electorate. The jury's still out on whether or not COVID-19 has been successfully tackled. You know, we've, we've done pretty well so far, although I notice the figures are going up again, uh, as, 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 as spiking again. But the real stress and strains associated with coming out of the COVID regulations uh, is going to be a major challenge to government. Will we have the capacity to do it? Uh, I would urge you all to go to the, the website, look up Ireland, have a look at the agreement that's been entered into between the two major parties, the traditional enemies of Irish politics, and then in alliance with the Greens, they've come up with a national plan and a lot of the, a lot of the material in there deals with environmental uh, and social justice issues. But, you know, we're not in a position at this stage to do that. Uh, we, we, we simply, our big issues aren't being addressed. The other issue, of course, which I mentioned earlier, was that the distrust that we have and the attacks on science and the attacks on expertise 
uh, are really uh, uh, drifting now in, in, in some jurisdictions into attacks on our independent agencies of accountability. Uh, in Eastern Europe, particularly in Hungary and Poland, uh, you've seen it, of course, uh, in, in, in uh, countries like the Philippines and recently uh, in, in Cambodia. You've got it in uh, Brazil and, of course, in the United States as well, the attacks on the independent agencies of accountability. And, and we, need to, we need to get some trust back into the system so that these important components are treated seriously uh, because of the role they play in making sure we get a public interest outcome from government. So where do citizens, juries and assemblies uh, come into this? Let's define them first of all. Big definition starts with random selection, uh, usually stratified to make sure you get a representation of your broader community uh, in what we would call a mini public. A, a, a mini public that is much smaller than the wider community, but is representative of that community. And uh, it's what we do, of course, when we, 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 we try to, uh, when we conduct criminal trials through the jury. The second feature of a, of a, of a deliberative assembly uh, is that the discussion between the people involved is properly facilitated so that there's, everyone gets their, their point of view across. Uh, we make sure that um, the questions that the people think are important, that information is gained uh, to take to the jury so they have all the information on the table. And, and then they can make a, a proper judgment. So it's these two issues that you have proper representation and you have proper deliberation. There is a third element that does add a lot of value. It's a tricky one because some governments find it very confronting, but to really make an assembly or a jury work well, you have to guarantee that the decision they make will become the law or will become the policy. Now, as soon as you say that to a government, they, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. We can't hand over our power, uh, our making of power uh, to another body like that. Uh, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are ways you can still defend uh, assemblies and juries and, and, and the deliberations that they have by saying they, they add extra advice to the government and without necessarily determining what the government uh, would do. In a case of our uh, dialogue with the city, incidentally, in 2003, we did say whatever the assembly came up with, we would do. And we did uh, through our, our planning instruments. But that's an issue you might like to think about. It's, it's, it's a tricky one because people who get executive power, even though they have to compromise in all sorts of ways with the upper houses of parliament, with the, uh, all of the pressure groups and interest groups in our society, uh, don't like the idea of compromising with a randomly selected deliberative group uh, uh, that, that uh, makes a particular recommendation to it. Just a quick point here, if you're interested in the history of this idea, of course, goes back to ancient Greece uh, and was a very prominent part of decision-making processes and then revived in Renaissance Italy uh, and uh, the late uh, uh, 13th, 5th, 14th, 15th century uh, in some of the city-states, we saw the application of this principle. Not to cover everything, but to cover some parts of the way that their government was to work. So it's not as if this is just a modern concept. It goes back to Greece, goes back to, Flo uh, to uh, Florence and, uh, and, and Venice. Uh, indeed, at the time of the, of the great Machiavelli, uh, um, Florence did have a form of uh, deliberative democracy operating. When might you use such a principle? Well, you might take a local issue. Those of you that would remember WA politics, we had that unbelievably conflicted issue of where the town hall of Albany would go when the town of Albany and the shire of Albany got together. Both of them said, oh, well, you know, the shire uh, and the town is going to be based in either in Albany or, or out of Albany. They just wouldn't get agreement. Alana McTiernan had set up a citizen's jury and they agreed that whatever the jury said, uh, they'd agree with, and indeed that problem was solved. You could, you could take all sorts of little issues that need some sort of resolution because the system can't seem to find a way through. Uh, uh, the system ought to, by the way, but, it, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't always find a way through. You might get the challenges of new technology, uh, artificial intelligence, for example, well, the, the questions that's posing. Do we actually know what a what, what, a, what a, an ordinary group of people think about that? Do, do we know what they, they thought about the question 
of uh, genetically modified crops. That was one where they had a major inquiry in some of the European countries to try to determine what the common view was. So new technologies coming on. Uh, the Scandinavians have always been pretty good at having processes of community consultation on that, not necessarily juries or assemblies, but certainly a consultation to deal with those issues. Uh, then you've got major society-wide issues, such as a city plan, a constitution. And the best case study we have here, of course, is from Ireland, where, as you would be aware, uh, they had uh, two major crises. They had a crisis of their church and, you know, the Catholic church and the abuse undermined the uh, trust of a, of a lot of the Irish people. And secondly, they had a crisis of their economy. Uh, and and uh, uh, there was a lot of soul searching going on. In order to deal with some issues associated with their constitution, they established the Citizens' Assembly. 66 uh, people were randomly selected uh, throughout stratified uh, selection process throughout Ireland, and 33 politicians representing the parties got together and looked at their constitution and made recommendations. The uh, Constitution of Ireland originally formed around a, a Catholic philosophy uh, of the family. And uh, as you know, uh, the recommendation came through for establishing equality uh, between uh, people and no discrimination on the basis of gender, including the capacity to marry, which went through on the recommendation of the, uh, of the Citizens' Assembly. It had to be voted on by a referendum, but it was. So they used it in that way. Uh, they're now in their new agreement between the two parties uh, and the Greens. There are some assemblies in there to deal with complex issues. Um, one, how they elect uh, their local government in Dublin. They're going to have an assembly. One over biodiversity issues. Uh, one uh, over a drug policy. The Parliament of Ireland have, have said they want to have a, uh, an injecting centre, but the, 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 they passed the law, but they can't seem to get it together. So they're, they're going to have an assembly to look at, uh, at that issue. And uh, there's another one which just escapes my mind at the moment. But th these are society-wide issues that can be tackled in a different way uh, and, and produce uh, results. It might be just a local government budget. Over here in New South Wales, uh, the city of Canada Bay had a, a citizen's budget process. They recommended to the council uh, that they needed to increase rates. You know, normally we think constituents will never say they want to increase in taxes or increase in rates. They said yes, but they also made comments on how the priorities were set. And that gave authority to the council to introduce some important changes that in the normal process of politics, they might never, never have achieved. So these are the sorts of areas in which we can, we can have um, a, a citizen's jury or assembly. Now, there's one more that I want to mention. And, and, and to me, this, is, this could be a priority within Australian governments. Currently, parliamentary committees uh, consult and, and they're required to consult people. They spend a lot of money on consultation. And I have to say that my experience of a lot of the consultation that is done, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's formalistic without a lot of content. A lot of money is spent to try to get the view of what interest groups and people think about things, but somehow or another, it's, it doesn't have the impact. And I think one of the reasons for that is that, that, that the suspicion is it's the usual suspects at work, vested interests, rather than what we might do with a lot of that consultation, which is to go through the parliamentary process and rather than advise the parliamentary committees on the basis of a town hall meeting where those who can shout loudest uh, uh, tend to dominate or, or through a process of consultation through uh, um, submissions where only the people who have a vested interest put the submissions in, is to have an assembly or a jury uh, to advise on these matters. I think there's a huge potential there for our system to involve people in new ways uh, that would start to get them feeling more confident about the system and, and, and the way it operates. In the state of Oregon, in the United States, it was an interesting experiment there where, as you know, in the US, lots of their states have citizens-initiated referenda. And so someone comes along and says they want uh, some issue debated, uh, they get the signatures and you, 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 it goes to referendum. What they did there in a very uh, effective process, uh, as you know, when you have a referendum, all the electors get a letter, 
the case for, written by the people in favour, the case against, as we did with the Republic referendum in 1999 in Australia. But in Oregon, what they did is they added to that a citizen's jury. What was their view on it? So when the electors are, uh, are considering their vote, they've got the case for, the case against, and the case as determined by a randomly selected assembly of people who uh, were engaged in a proper facilitated deliberation with all of the information that they needed. So I think our parliament could really do well uh, to add this element to the equation. They're already spending money on consultation. I don't think we're getting the value from it uh, that, that we ought to get. Okay, so let me now just uh, uh, take up some of the, the questions that come up in relation to uh, citizens' assemblies and citizens' juries. Uh, well, some people say this is all very middle class. This is all very middle class. What you've got is, is the people who, who, who know a little bit more, uh, who have a little bit more uh, confidence, have, a, have more, uh, if you like, uh, practice at putting forward points of view, will, will be the ones that will, will dominate such, such proceedings. Well, the evidence doesn't show that. The evidence is quite fascinating, in fact. Uh, it, and I'll just quote from some research that was done uh, in, 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 in 2017, uh, including from a, some Australian academics, but it's an international journal. Deliberative democracy curtails rather than perpetuates elite domination by creating space for ordinary political actors to create, contest and reflect upon ideas, options and discourses. And they do. And indeed, what comes out of a lot of the uh, juries and assemblies that look at policy uh, are very sensible conclusions, very actionable proposals. In other words, things you could take into the system pretty straight away, well, pretty well straight away. And, and also uh, uh, what we would call very defensible uh, uh, propositions. People, when given authority, come up to the mark. And, and I think this is a very important part of the case for using citizens' assemblies and juries more. It's giving authority to ordinary people, not, not in the way that you have in an opinion poll where someone asks a question and you say yes or no, or whether you're, you're, you're just asked your opinion uh, uh, and, and you don't have time to think about it, you just blurt it out, and that becomes the basis of what we call public opinion, rather than the opinions that come out of a properly selected, uh, uh, inclusive group of our community, representative of the community that's properly deliberated. So that's point number one. Point number two is that there's, there's, there's no doubt uh, that the uh, trust question can be addressed through the uh, effective use of such procedures. Indeed, we find uh, that countries have some deep divisions. There's some deep divisions in, in, in our society in Australia, and we're going to see them coming out. Uh, in the next couple of years over employment, uh, over the question of employment, over the question of the continuation of some of the measures that we have. These will be big differences uh, in our community. And it might make it very difficult to bring about significant uh, a change uh, that we find when some of these big differences occur uh, and, and, and they're not solved, which undermines public credibility uh, in, in the government, uh, that by using a jury on assembly, we can create a lot of authority and therefore, some of these big differences can be handled in, in a proper, uh, uh, orderly way to get a resolution so that you can go forward. You know, Julia Gillard proposed a Citizens', citizens Assembly for Climate. Remember that? Back in 2010. The trouble there was there was so much progress made on that issue, it, it looked as though it was just a delaying tactic. And so, you know, sometimes it's the big issues, you, you've really just got to get on with it and do it. But... As you're building up to an issue, if you can add to that the authority of a citizen's assembly or jury, it will add value and, and, and enable you to do some of those bigger things that need doing. As I said, in Ireland, they've got a, they've got a few of them on their, on, on their agenda uh, currently. So my picture here is this. We've got representative democracy. We've got to deal with some issues there, particularly about uh, donations and the way they operate. Uh, we've got accountability agencies part of the monetary democracy. Uh, again, there, there's, there's some undermining going on there in some jurisdictions, uh, and, and uh, I think that's very bad for the public interest. But if we can add to that 
a proper use of juries and assemblies, I think we can do a number of things. We can start to restore that trust that I talked about. Uh, and certainly, it's the experience of politicians that uh, use these uh, instruments uh, that, that they're well received by the public, well received by the public, because it's the public that are doing it. It's the representative sample of the people that are doing it. And, and, and so trust can be built. Secondly, I mean, as I pointed out, you've got some intractable issues, either local ones or big national issues that just simply are not getting the attention they deserve or the authority. And people find it so much easier to go to the political game. Oh, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. And you get that sort of politicisation, which when it comes to some big questions is understandable. I mean, those of us on the left of centre side have a different view of the economy than those on it with a right of centre view. But at some point, you've got to get away through those differences and, and, and take it forward. And if you take it forward without authority, you might have a, a success, but then it's overturned by a change of government. Uh, you know, we've got to be in the business of institutionalising uh, 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 the climate... Uh, 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 sorry, we, of institutionalising uh, institutionalizing some of those mechanisms we need to uh, lower the emissions and to create a better world for our children and our grandchildren. And without authority, that's not going to be uh, possible. Thirdly, and, and linked to the, the other two, is we really have to address this question of right-wing populism. It, it, is, it, is, it is, you can see how it's operating in the United States. You see how it's operating in some parts of Eastern Europe. And even, of course, it came up throughout the Brexit campaign in, in the United Kingdom. Um, it's it's not a good thing, and I, and I declare on this one uh, that I think uh, uh, we really do have to have expertise, we do have to have science, we do have to have evidence. It's not always as easy as the scientists think. It's not always as easy as the public policy uh, people think, but you do need to have it. And, and one of the features we had in Australia in recent years was that the state premiers and the prime minister did take on board evidence when it came to looking at how we're going to tackle uh, the, the possible spread of the coronavirus and also how we're going to set up our uh, hospitals and whatever to deal if there was a, a major outbreak. The governments did look to evidence and it is important. And the fact that we have a whole movement now around the world that says evidence doesn't matter, it's my opinion that matters, and it doesn't matter what the evidence is for or against, it's my opinion, therefore uh, I have every right to pursue it. And, and that attitude is really undermining, I think, uh, good government. So for those three reasons, I think uh, we, we ought to be using this uh, system a lot more uh, within, our, within our polity uh, to solve major issues, to build up trust and to try to fight against this cancer of authoritarian populism. Thanks very much. Thanks, Stu. Thank you.